Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. Never tell our business to strangers. That's what Jennifer Massio was told growing up, but it wasn't until she was an adult that she learned the reason why. Jennifer's essay is read by Ruth Wilson. Ruth has starred in The Affair and Luther. You can see her now in His Dark Materials on HBO. Nine years ago, when my mother suffered a minor heart attack, my father and I learned that for more than two decades, she had been lying about her age. She was actually three years older than my father, not two years younger, as she had always said. Apparently sensing that her real age might be relevant to her treatment, she had given the nurse her actual birth date. And then my father and I saw it scrawled on her plastic hospital bracelet. (laughs) That my mother had maintained this deception for so long shouldn't have surprised me. My parents were all about deception on a grand scale. False identities, hidden pasts, dark deeds. As an only child, I was mostly isolated with my parents throughout my childhood as we crisscrossed the country, went bankrupt three times, and had run-ins with the law. It was not a normal childhood, but then what did I know of normal? My parents were my whole world, and I loved them. I was especially devoted to my father, who showered me with attention, sneaking candy under my pillow that my mother had forbidden me to eat. It wasn't until I was an adult and discovered just how dark their past was that my love and loyalty were severely tested. And I'm still not sure what to make of the scattered truths and fictions that define who I am today. For me, our story began when I was five years old and the FBI came for my father. We were living in Irvine, California, where he had a small carpet cleaning business. My older cousin happened to be visiting from Florida and my mother told her to keep me in my bedroom as the agents arrested my father. It was a harrowing ordeal. Distraught, I rushed my bedroom door time and again, trying to get to my father as my cousin restrained me. What had he done? My mother first told me they had mistaken him for someone with the same name, and there is, in fact, an organised crime figure with his name. After his arrest led to his detention, however, my mother conceded that he'd done something wrong, but she wouldn't tell me what. Regardless... Our lives were turned upside down. The FBI took my father to New York and my mother followed to arrange for his defence, while I was sent to live with my aunt in North Miami Beach. A parade of character witnesses testifying to my father's honest work as a carpet cleaner finally led to his release a year later. I didn't learn of his release until my parents showed up in Florida on my aunt's doorstep, which was the best surprise I have ever received and remains my fondest memory of my parents. I was six years old. We stayed in Florida for a few months until my father, who had gotten a job as a line cook, could save enough money to take us back to California. When we returned, we kept on the move, living over the years in Garden Grove, El Toro, Lake Forest, Mission Viejo, Laguna Hills, Aliso Viejo, and Laguna Niguel. The nature of our cocoon-like existence led me to trust only my parents, to look only to them to tell me who I was, and to feel fearful and disloyal for seeking outside comfort. 
My parents' mantra drilled into me was, never tell our business to strangers. And I didn't. But I wasn't even sure who we were or what our business was. Until I was five, I knew our last name to be Cassis. But then my parents told me our real last name was Masia. Cassis was the surname of a prison buddy of my father's. I knew my father both as John, his real name, and Frank, his father's. And during our brief time in Houston, he had apparently gone by Nicholas. The day after I graduated from high school, we packed our belongings into a U-Haul and moved to New York where my father had friends who could get him work. He joined a painting crew, earning $100 a day, leaving my mother and me with nothing to do for the summer but drive around Long Island in a car that was soon to be repossessed, talking. After one of these drives, I broke down in tears, recalling the anguish of the day my father was arrested. I deserve to know what happened, I told her. At my insistence, she finally opened up. She began by telling me the real story of how she and my father met, which was not through friends, as had been their story, but at the Fishkill Correctional Facility in New York, where my father had been incarcerated for racketeering. My mother was a high school teacher with a humanitarian bent, who visited prisons hoping to write a book about the prison reform movement. My father was among the inmates she interviewed. Their interviews gave way to animal attraction. And when my father was paroled a few months later, they started dating. Within a year, they married and moved from New York to Miami so he could escape from his previous life of crime. But after I was born, he went back to his old partners and to their sources of income, bulk marijuana and cocaine sales in the port of Miami. When I was a year old, my father was arrested on cocaine possession charges. The authorities didn't yet know he had violated his parole and mistakenly let him out on bail. And the second my parents stepped outside, my father said to my mother, if we stay here, I'm going to end up dead or in jail. I'm running. You coming? Of course, she answered. It would prove to be the defining moment of her life, and mine. And so, as she explained, it was that act, skipping out on bail and then crossing state lines, that led to my father's being arrested by the FBI in California five years later. Which was the truth. But not, as it turned out, the whole truth. A year after my mother and I had this conversation, when I was in college, I read a newspaper article about a woman who had searched an online database for criminals who had been shuffled through the New York State Corrections Department. One afternoon, I found the site and typed my father's last name into the search field. His record appeared, and I was able to verify that it was the right John Massia. The birth date matched. I scrolled down the page past his identification number to a table listing crimes of conviction. And there it was. The real act that had bound the three of us together. Murder. I sat silently as my centre seemed to drop through the floor. By then, my father was dying of lung cancer... And in his remaining time, I never told him what I had learned. For my whole life, he had tried to protect me from his darkest secret. And I didn't feel able to broach it with him now. It took me days to confront my mother, who mostly reacted with concern that my father's awful past was available to anyone with a modem. A year later, my father died. At the memorial service, I stood and eulogised him, declaring, My parents and I are soulmates. We are cut from the same cloth and nothing, not even death, can change what we mean to each other. 
The type of bond we have transcends death. It exists even today, even in this very room. I meant it. But what I didn't fully appreciate then was that my parents were the true soulmates, bound by ugly crimes. As a child, I had always felt their united front against the world, and sometimes me. But I didn't know why until last winter, when my mother had a stroke and was close to dying herself. When she emerged from her haze, she somehow felt compelled to tell me the rest. Your father did some bad things after he got out of jail, Jenny. No. Was it possible he had repeated the crime that put him away in the 1960s and 70s? Tell me, I said. Was it... She nodded. How many? Four, maybe five, she said sheepishly. I was reeling. It was after you were born, she continued. It, it was part of that life. He was doing a job, and one of the byproducts of that job was to do what he did. She went on to explain that his victims were fellow drug dealers, as if that made it more palatable. No matter. The horror of my father's legacy was too much to bear. I fled, sobbing. Nineteen days later, my mother suffered a heart attack and died. I never reported my mother's rambling deathbed confession to anyone. I knew so little. The crimes, if true, were more than twenty-five years old. My parents were gone and I wanted their past buried with them. Or so I told myself. I have since marvelled at my mother's choice to stay with my father and to defend him, though of course I loved him too, albeit in ignorance. He and my mother were all I had, and although my mother was deceitful and overbearing, she was also my best friend. If I didn't tell her about something, it felt as if it hadn't happened. In her final days, after the heart attack had sapped her strength and nearly left her brain dead, I ducked into a bathroom in the intensive care unit and I saw myself in the mirror. And that's when I felt it. Not a crack, but a slow tearing of the fibre that connected us. I stood in the unforgiving fluorescent glow and I saw that for the first time, I was standing alone. I was 28 and I could no longer look to my parents to tell me who I was. I had outlived their past, and now it was up to me to create a new future. The bad was still with me, of course, but so was the good. A few days after my mother's death, I was snooping on her computer and found three unnotarized wills languishing among various email messages and letters she had saved. In each, she gave me detailed instructions on how to extract cash advances from her credit cards, betraying her larcenous streak to the end. After those instructions, to my utter surprise, was this. Dear Jenny, I loved you very much. I was astonished that at my age I could have had such a lovely, funny, beautiful child. Your father and I both loved you very much. I hope you know this, that in spite of imagined or real hurts, and all the times we were separated or fought with you or each other, that we showed you that love. We three were a family, a real one, that sat down to dinner together and explored and travelled together even if we didn't go to the Grand Canyon. Wherever I am, even though I'm not a believer, I know that part of me will belong to this earth somewhere. And thus, part of the earth will always remember and love you.
Ruth Wilson, reading Jennifer Massia's essay, Never Tell Our Business to Strangers. We'll catch up with Jennifer after the break. When we talked to Jennifer Massia, she said that her love for her father always ran deep. My father and I were extremely close. Uh, He'd be the one to drive me to school because he had to go clean carpets in the morning, so we'd make up silly songs on the way. And, um, you know, he'd tell me stories about his crazy adventures, you know, as a kid in Coney Island, leaving out a lot. He was really the guiding force in my younger life, which is why when the FBI and the police came for him when I was five, it was devastating. It was like a light went out. After her essay was published in 2007, Jennifer decided to keep investigating her father. She eventually wrote a book about what she discovered. In a way, it's like there's two John Massias. You know, there's the father that I grew up with, and then there's the father I've come to know through all of my investigating And in a way, I'm glad that they never fused together because it's extremely difficult knowing that someone you love who gave you life was responsible for ending lives, something that I couldn't even imagine in a self-defense scenario. It's hard to reconcile being related to a murderer and somebody who I found out even after I published the book was more of a murderer than I thought. Jennifer learned that disturbing fact several years ago when she went to brunch with the son of one of her father's former accomplices. He said, you know, um, some people who were in that life with your father were kind of disappointed at your portrayal of him. And I'm like, oh, no, you mean because I did the one thing you're not supposed to do? I talked about the things he did, you know? He said, no, it's because you didn't portray him as brutally as he was in real life. And I said, what do you mean? And as I'm sitting here eating my brunch, he tells me that my father was uh, rather brazen. Um, He was responsible for a number of broad daylight hits. That was a a uh, soul-rattling day. You know, everybody wants to quantify these horrific experiences. And I said, how many people did my father kill? And He said, well, judging by my father's body count and your father's body count, is probably in the, you know, dozens. And, yeah, what do you even say to that? Jennifer never talked to her father about his criminal past, but she's imagined conversations with him about it. But mostly the conversations I want to have now are, my mom told me later, my father came to believe that every life was precious and that he had nightmares over what he did. I don't, I don't know if that's true. That's the part I'd want to discuss with him. Jennifer is 41 now. Her parents died more than a decade ago, but she says they were the defining relationship of her life. I haven't been married. I don't have children of my own. So that was my family. That was the family I got. And I still see myself as one of a unit of three. I live a very, very different life than they did, though. I'm responsible. I pay my taxes. You know, I nothing's off the books. But maybe because, you know, when people start to lose their parents, they typically have their own families already. And because I don't, my identity is very much still wrapped up with theirs. Today... Jennifer is a journalist writing about gun violence. She started on that beat when she worked alongside columnist Joe Nocera on a project that recorded daily incidents of gun violence in America. About six months into the project, uh, he comes out one day and he says, you know, it's interesting because your father perpetrated gun violence. So do you feel like, you know, you're kind of making up for what he did? And I sat there with my jaw on the floor because... You know, as journalists, we're taught to always look outward. I had not even put it together that this field, this beat, could be a way 
to try to atone for what my father did. My father put gun violence out into the world quite a bit. And by covering it, maybe, just maybe, it could contribute to a possible solution, whatever that solution is. Jennifer's father isn't the only one who still has a large presence in her life. Her mother does too. And that's one of the reasons why she wanted to include her mother's note in her modern love essay. Her words in that will that I found were more beautiful than anything that I had written before that. That was the most beautiful thing I'd ever read. She didn't really believe in an afterlife or the Judeo-Christian story of what happens to us after we die and the fact that she put it in those terms wherever I go. You know, like even if you scatter my ashes, I'm still going to be part of the earth. So just know that somewhere, someone is loving and remembering you. I mean, it gives me chills even now. That's Jennifer Massia. She's a journalist working for The Trace, a nonprofit news organization that covers gun violence. The book she wrote about her father is also called Never Tell Our Business to Strangers. More from Ruth Wilson and Daniel Jones after the break. Ruth Wilson says that Jennifer's story resonated with her own family's story. I found out 15 years ago that there's lots of dark secrets within my own family. And my grandfather himself uh, was a bigamist four times over and also in trouble with the law, in, in and out of jail, and a spy, and all sorts of many things that um, completely turned my life and my father's life certainly my father's life, upside down. So I really resonate with the idea of, you know, identity and family history and legacy and kind of filling mysteries and holes in later life. So that's why I chose this story to tell. Thanks to Ruth for reading this week's piece. You can see her now in His Dark Materials on HBO. And she made a mini-series about her grandparents' story. It's called Mrs. Wilson. Here's Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for the New York Times. I don't think of Jennifer's story um, as the typical kind of love story, even within the wide range of love stories that we publish in the column. But it's just such a full bodied story. It just has so much in it. And I love the sort of structure of her wanting to sort of distance herself from her parents. And when she's looking in the mirror at the end and actually feeling like she's her own person finally. So it it was just such a good and brave portrait of being able to recount, you know, what you grew up in. And, you know, for any kid, like, what you grow up in is sort of, that's what's normal. And her coming into understanding and wanting to pull away, but not allowing herself to pull away completely because that wouldn't have been the truth. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Caitlin O'Keefe. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. Additional help this week from Mike Moschetto. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Special thanks to Julia Simon, Anya Stremian, and Mia Lee at the New York Times. Additional music courtesy of APM. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And by the way, my other job is hosting an NPR show called On Point. Check it out in your podcast feed. See you next week.